Here's another cutaway photo. This is our, um, our hamburger cutaway. Well, people often ask how we cut, how we do this, and of course we cut stuff, we have a machine shop, that's really how we do it. Um, but then they say, well, how do you keep stuff like, how do you keep those coals from falling off? I said, oh, we didn't. They fell off. There's a guy beneath there with a pair of tongs, and every time the, they come off, you put it back up. And our motto was very simple. It only had to look good for a thousandth of a second. <laughs> you know, if it all went to hell afterwards, so what? So, you know, cooking with pots cut in half is terribly messy, often dangerous, but if you do it right, you get some cool shots. <laughs> um, the point of that was really to explain that uh, the uh, grilling comes, uh, grilling and actually the properties of a hamburger come from a bunch of scientific principles. One is the flavor of grilling is largely from those fat flare-ups. When fat drips down and it has those flare-ups, the incomplete combustion and pyroly pyrolysis from that creates grilled flavors. Uh, people who grill vegetables often wonder why they don't have all those great grilled flavors. The reason is they don't have any fat dripping down. Um, so if next uh, summer when you're grilling corn or you're grilling zucchini or something like that, slather it with oil or butter, or what I do is I have a squirt bottle full of it. Um, you squirt it in the fire, and boy, you get the grilled flavor. Um, so we, um, we did this hamburger because we wanted to illustrate a bunch of different techniques. Uh, we discuss how to grind the meat. It turns out there's a specific way to grind the meat that makes a difference. Um, the, we make the bun. Every single part of that hamburger, we have gone and optimized, because we have a philosophy that it's important to consider any food as valid. And it's just as valid to make the ideal hamburger as it is to make a coco van or bouillabaisse or some other dish that's far more celebrated. It doesn't mean you always eat the ultimate burger, uh, but it means that you do at least, intellectually, it's worth at least exploring what it would do. Now, one of the things we came after having the ultimate all this is how are we going to cook the burger? What's the ultimate way to actually cook the burger? We came up with a technique called cryo-frying. We cook things sous vide, we freeze it in liquid nitrogen, then we deep fry it in oil. <laughs> now, the sous vide step is you, you cook stuff typically in a water bath. Here we're cooking some small fish. Um, uh, with the hamburger, it's actually important not to seal the sous vide bag. The pressure of sealing the sous vide bag makes the patty too dense, at least by our taste. Uh, you cook it at very low temperature. We cook it typically at um, about 125 degrees to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that makes it cooked, but then liquid nitrogen comes in, and now we're going to deviate from the demo. Now, it's very important to have safety gear. <laughs> this is liquid nitrogen. So we're going to pour some in here. Now, do you notice I'm pouring awfully fast and the level's not coming up? That's because I'm boiling a lot of it as it comes in, because the doer's warm. Okay. Now, this is vigorously boiling, because, of course, the boiling point is at minus 196 uh, um, centigrade, about 321 Fahrenheit. Now, one thing you should never, ever do with liquid nitrogen is that. <laughs> or do this. The reason I'm able to do that is because the n liquid nitrogen has got two properties that make that a possible thing. The first is that it doesn't have that much, uh, the latent heat of fusion, the amount of energy it takes to boil liquid. Now, watch how it's cooled down, how it's calmed down. I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Boiling liquid nitrogen doesn't release as much heat as boil, or require as much heat, excuse me, as boiling water. So although it, as it boils, a lot of heat is coming out, it's not coming out as fast as you might think. But the other reason you can do that is that as I dip my finger in there, it boils around me in, the, in something called the Leidenfrost effect. And so you get a thin layer of nitrogen gas around the outside. And nitrogen gas doesn't conduct heat very well. We will return to the liquid nitrogen in a moment. Somebody earlier asked if, I, if chefs actually have groupies. The answer is no, the, the flower is part of the demo. <laughs> um, 
So if you do freeze things liquid nitrogen, however, they can become very brittle. Here's a piece of corn that we hit in our lab. So liquid the, the, uh, the hamburger comes out of the sous vide, it goes into liquid nitrogen, and then we need to, to uh, cook it. Now, why liquid nitrogen? Because we want to get the outside of the hamburger and maybe the first millimeter of the hamburger to be intensely cold or frozen. Because then when we put it into the deep fryer, we can heat the outside, but there's a cold barrier. And that barrier prevents the inside from overheating. So it's about 30 seconds in the liquid nitrogen, then it goes right into the hot oil. Here it's going into the hot oil. Here it comes out. Um, the reason that it's, it's great to cook this in hot oil, by the way, is that um, you've got lots of these cylinders of meat in a hamburger, and there's little crenulations and crevices in between them. Well, if you put it on a grill, it only gets the surface, but the oil penetrates so it gets crispier. Now, here it's calmed down. The reason it's calmed down is there's super cold nitrogen now in this layer up here, so now it's insulating the, the nitrogen from the whole rest of the room. So, <laughs> that's why I didn't leave my fingers in there for very long. <laughs> Once it gets cold enough that liquid nitrogen is, starts closing in, it gets cold in a hurry. So you can, you can easily do that, but you don't want to leave it in there for long. Okay. This is the result. So the hamburger is medium rare, except at the very edge, where it's, it's cooked. And it's very hard to achieve that if you don't use liquid nitrogen. Uh, of course, at the actual surface, the meat's browned. It's the Maillard reaction again. Um, this is a, um, a, a photo that I took of, of meat browning. It's about um, two millimeters across the whole frame. The part that's actually brown is extremely small. And the reason is, it's, A, it's got a huge heat sink behind it, but that heat sink is full of water. And when you put a steak in a pan, all that bubbling, that that's comes from little steam volcanoes underneath the surface. You can see we've got some arrows drawn about here. That's the boiling zone. That's where the steam is being generated. And it's only the extreme edge, a fraction of a millimeter, that actually is raised enough above the um, boiling point that it can brown. And when you look at it, it's actually a gel. It's a clear gel. The optical properties, when you look far enough away, make it look different. Also, you see the layer of white? That's not fat. That's cooked beef. When you look under a microscope and you put enough light on it, beef's white. When you zoom back out, there's enough uh, vesicles around it. There's some other things. It, it gets this kind of a grayish thing, and you get a little bit of brown from the edge but it's actually quite white.